It's so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad you're here this morning. Let's all stand together and sing. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul.
This mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible, for all who call on him.
are singing in the choir and you do not have a solo but you have a mic attached to you you're nervous the whole time <laughs> you're nervous the whole time oh man take your bibles if you're not already there and turn to mark chapter 5 mark chapter 5 as you're turning there i want you to think with me for just a second about your favorite movie. Go ahead and get your favorite movie in your mind, all right? Think about it for a minute. Maybe you're not a movie person. Think about your favorite book, all right? Your favorite book. I want you to kind of grab a hold of that. Think about it. All right, now, what genre is it? You know, just kind of just grab onto that. What, what genre is it? What is it about that movie? What is it about that book that you love? Think about your favorite part of that movie, your favorite, your favorite scene in the movie or your favorite scene in that, in that book. Think about that for a second. Maybe, maybe you've got a favorite author or a favorite director. Anytime they've got a new book release, anytime a new movie comes out and their name is attached to it, you are going to go see it, right? What is it about that author, that director, that you just cannot get enough? What is it about their style that you just, you just love? You have to have that. You have to hear it. You have to uh, see it. The plot of a movie... Or a book is basically what happens in the storyline. And we love a good storyline. But one thing that really sets apart a good storyline or a good plot is the plot twist, right? Think about it for a second. The plot twist. I, I started thinking about the plot twist and really I, I found a definition for it. A plot twist is a literary technique that introduces a radical change in the direction or expected outcome of a plot in a work. Writers work endlessly to try to get a good plot twist. And some would say if they don't have a good plot twist, they don't have a good work. And we love plot twists in movies and books. We love those type of plot twists. For example, uh, in the Planet of the Apes, the plot, three astronauts crash land on an unknown planet after traveling at light speed for 2,000 plus years. And in this new land, Primates rule the world, while humans are considered second-class citizens. The twist is that the final scene of the movie, the surviving astronaut stumbles across a half-sunken Statue of Liberty on the shore and realizes that he had been on Earth the whole time. How about The Sixth Sense? Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, if you have not seen these yet, I'm sorry, you're probably not going to see these at this point. Uh, so I don't even apologize for giving away the twist. But the plot, after a home invasion, Dr. Malcolm Crow, a child psychologist, returns to work by attempting to help a young boy who sees the dead. The twist, Dr. Crow is actually dead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of you are like, the younger people over here are like, really? I, I got to see that movie. Yeah. We, we like a good plot twist. Matter of fact, for both of these movies and some others, I, I looked up and I was kind of looking at some of the plot twists, famous plot twists that are out there. 
and I watched the scenes. Apparently, Planet of the Apes, according to the, the video that I was watching, just watching the technology of the day back then, it was apparently recorded back in the early 1900s because of some of the, <laughs> the scenes that I saw and the imagery that I saw and the Statue of Liberty that was sunk into the ground but still only about 10 feet taller than the guy. And, uh, you know, some of the graphics there, I, I, I was kind of thrown off by. But the plot twist, the plot twist was good, right? We like it when a movie or a book has a good plot twist. It brings that shock factor that you walk away going, wow, that was good. I never saw that coming, right? But in life, we do not like plot twists very often. Even if it turns out for our good, in the moment, we don't like the plot twist. Because things may be going bad, but at least I'm used to it, right? <laughs> things might be going the wrong direction, but at least I wasn't caught off surprised by it, right? The plot twist, when things change, all of a sudden, when that radical change takes place, and it's like, what is going on? Some plot twist leads to a, a happy ending, and others lead to a sad or somber ending. This is, this is true in life as well. As we look at Scripture, we see historical readings or recordings of, of the biblical characters and their lives, experiences that they had. And throughout, we see plot twists. We see uh, how they are shaped by those plot twists. We see how they respond to those things. And while there are a number of these that I would like to share with you um, as, as time moves on in the, in the future, I would like to share and come back to this thought, these plot twists. I'd like to open up a few of these. But today, this morning, I want to focus on this one found in Mark chapter 5. And we actually see a, a couple of them right in the middle of this story that is just unexpected moments. In this event, we actually see a couple of men who are possessed by demons. And as we, as we read it and we go on, we find that in, in Mark's gospel, in his account, he focuses on one man in particular and actually omits the other person. He just kind of focuses on this one who is possessed. We find out in Matthew that it is actually there's two of them that are there. But one of them was apparently, maybe he was a little more uh, outspoken. Maybe he was a little bit more aggressive. Maybe his case was a little bit worse. But he was the focus of the story. And the focus of Mark. As we look at this man, we find that he was possessed by a legion of demons. When they say a legion, that could have been up to 6,000 in, in a Roman army, uh, 6,000 soldiers. And while we do not know the exact amount of the demons that possessed this man, we do know that when Jesus cast them out, he sent them into a bunch of pigs that were nearby, and there were around 2,000 pigs. So math would tell me, or common sense would tell me, there's probably around 2,000 at least possessing these couple of guys. And as I, as I thought about that, I started thinking about my life. You know, one way that this man was described was that, it, it said a couple of times that no man could tame him. And I think a lot of us, when we read the story of a, a possessed man like this, a situation like this, we go, well, at least I'm not that far off, right? I'm not, I'm not like that, <laughs> right? But I want you to focus on that word untamed for just a minute. And let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. There are moments in our lives where outwardly we may be tamed, but inwardly we're like wolves, <laughs> Right? Outwardly, we may show the control, but inwardly, our, 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 our minds are running wild. Our thoughts, our, our desires, our lust is running wild. In private, we run wild when nobody else sees. And I think we don't want to admit how much we relate to the demoniac over here. We don't want to admit how much we relate to this story. But if we think about it, as we consider the truth of Scripture and what it has to say about us, about each and every individual, that all of us have gone astray, that all of us have sinned in our lives, that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, 
that there is none righteous, not even one. When we consider scriptures like those, we realize, wait a minute, I'm not that different. And we could come to this conclusion where we wonder, for God to choose us, why? It actually makes no sense at all. It makes no sense at all. God, why would you choose me? What good did you see in me? What could I offer you? Why would you want me? And so to, today, this is the plot twist for us. Despite your past and your failures, your flaws and your weaknesses, he chose you. That's the plot twist. He chose you. And let that grab a hold of you for just a second. Think about where you were. Think about how you lived. Think about where you could be and where you would be. And recognize that he chose you. There was nothing you, good that you did to deserve it. He came looking for you when you didn't even realize you had a need. Or you at least didn't realize what the answer to your need was. He saw everything about you, your flaws. He saw every addiction, every struggle, every abuse, every wickedness, every weakness, every emotion. He saw it all. And yet, he chose you. And what does he want you to do now? What is, how does he want you to live now? Well, what we see in the life of this man is that he wants you to go. And in the lives of many people that he worked miracles in, we see this response, go, go. We see things like, go and sin no more. Go, take up your bed, go home. We see things, and in his case, we see him where he says, go and tell your family what I've done for you. Go. When we, when we think about Jesus and him reaching out to us and the commands that he has for us, what is it that Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to go. Go free from your past. Go free from your fears. Go. He wants you to go to a world of others that are without hope, that are lost, that are, that are bound by these chains. Go. He wants you to go and bear fruit, the Bible says. Fruit that glorifies the Father. He wants you to go. So the one thing that I want to give you, you, you know I like to give you just one idea, one thing that if you're going to leave, this is it. This is, what, this is what you're going to take. He chose you. He chose you, so go. He chose you, so go. And we're going to kind of open up what that means. Because let's be honest, moving on from a life chained to sin and self-indulgences, it seems impossible. It seems unlikely. It seems not even realistic. But I think he chose a man like the demoniac on purpose. So that those of us who may seem to have it together a little bit better have no excuse. If he can do it in him, he can do it in me. And he can do it in you. He chose you, so go. What does that look like? First of all, understand that you are no longer a captive to your problems. You are no longer captive to your problems. We see this in, in the passage here, but uh, if, if you think about, about this and you, you, you think, man, I've, I have got a, a, a troubled past, Jake. You don't know about my past. You don't know about my life. Let me just stop you right there. And say, again, the example of this guy. The struggles that he had. Matter of fact, let's look together in, in Mark chapter 5 and verse number 1. It says, And they, they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Okay? And in verse 3 it says, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken into pieces, and neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones." 
we see the life of this man who is broken and, and honestly out of reach. He was out of reach uh, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. He was, we, we talk about people that are too far gone. This guy, he was too far gone. Think about it. Physically, he was on the other side of the sea, what we just read. He was in a Gentile city. He was living in the graveyards. And, and remember, in their culture, to touch a dead body, that was unclean, right? Living in the graveyards. He was next to a herd of pigs. Not a good Jew. I'm just going to tell you. Living in a graveyard and living next to pigs, unclean, not good, right? He, he, was, he was so far out of reach, there wasn't a Pharisee or religious leader that would be able to step in and help this guy. He was too far gone. Not only physically, but mentally. He's, he's called insane. He had no control of his body. He was violent against others and himself. His mental state was so impossible. Nobody could even, nobody could, could talk sense into him. Emotionally. He cried through the night. He cut himself. He abused himself. Depressed and alone. Only the people, only person that was around him was people uh, that were as bad off as he was. The blind leading the blind. He, was, he had lost his family and his friends. Spiritually. He was a slave in his own body. Uh, in, in addition to his own sin nature that we all deal with, he was bound by thousands of demons that had full control of him. These demons, uh, they would not relent. Anyone who tried to arrest him or stop him, anyone that tried to come and, and, and bind him to keep him from hurting anyone else or hurting himself, when they would show up, he would just, these demons would take control and break the chains. Unreal, And I know that that sounds impossible today in our uh, modern society, in our modern culture. But you spend some time with some missionaries, uh, and some friends that, that I have, just that have story after story of Jake. That stuff may seem unreal to you here in America, but out where I'm working, out where I'm serving, that's the type of stuff that we run across. We're dealing with this. This stuff is real. Spiritually gone. No matter who tried to reach him, it never worked out. Have you ever felt like that? No matter what that person says, it doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to help. Yeah, I know the verse. Thanks. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I, I heard that one in Sunday school too. Thanks. Right? I think we relate. Right? We've been there. And we have problems that we deal with, problems that we struggle with. Maybe there's a physical separation from the people you love. And, and it could have nothing to do with you and nothing you've done. Nothing they've, it's just circumstances. Maybe a job called that person away or some type of separation that's happened there. You didn't ask for it. They didn't ask for it. It just happened. Maybe it could be that you're, you're feeling mentally exhausted, trying your best, but nothing seems to help. You can't sleep. You can't rest. You can't just shut it all down and recover. Your mind seems to be running nonstop. You're worrying about this, worrying about that, worrying about health, all these things. And, and, and mentally, you're exhausted. Your brain just hurts. And nowadays, anytime you get a headache, you're worried you got COVID, right? Like, honestly, we're wor we worry about all kinds of things. And mentally, we are drained and, and, and emotionally, right? Emotionally. You're not just tired, like ready to stop thinking, but emotionally, you are worn down. If you're not there now, you, you know what it's like, right? Like we've all been there where emotionally we just couldn't take any more. You just checked out though. You're here, but you're not here. You've tried to stay strong, but hardening the emotions on the outside really only seems to cage them on the inside to where now you're just, the only thing you've effectively done is kept other people out and fight the battle alone. It's a struggle, but honestly, now you're feeling spiritually drained. 
disconnected. Disconnected from God. Disconnected from any power. And the truth is they're all tied together and the goal of the enemy is to get you here. If he can physically break you down, mentally, emotionally, eventually you are going to feel spiritually drained. And he's trying to chip away to where he can get you there. And the answer to this is an encounter with Jesus. The answer to this is an encounter with Jesus, just like this man went through. When Jesus stepped foot into that city, it made a difference. And the reality is this, Jesus knew he was going to be rejected by all those other people. Jesus knew he was going to be rejected by people there. But he still came looking for that one. Don't ever think that Jesus wouldn't come looking just for one. He's talked about, man, he talked about how he'd leave the, leave the 99 to go find the one. And this was a prime example of it. You're not too far gone. See, it's not that problems never arise for the believer. It's, not, it's that now you have a new way of dealing with them. You have a new way of looking at them. You have a new way of conquering them. Where before you may run to drink or drug, before you may bury yourself in work or your hobbies, before you hid, you isolated yourself, but now you have a strong tower that you can turn to. David said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. He chose you, so go. Go to him when you feel overwhelmed. Go to him when you feel outnumbered by the enemy. Go to him from darkness to light. You are no longer captive to your problems. Secondly, you are no longer carried by your power. You are no longer carried by your power. We read it there uh, in, in verse number 15. It says, And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. What has happened? What is going on that this man that we knew, this wild man, is now sitting there completely under control, completely tamed? He's not chained. There's not people surrounding him, holding him down. He's not growling. He's not spitting at us. What has happened? And, and, and honestly, the fear being, who is this guy that he could do something like that to him? And, and, and if this guy right here, this demon-possessed man, was strong enough to take out all of us, and this guy by himself just calmed him down, if he's scared of him, then what more could he do to us? And they're terrified. But the reality for the man that's sitting there, while they're totally confused, the reality was that this man was no longer carried about by his own power. He was no longer fighting by his own power. See, you are no longer limited by your power. The man that was overcome by these demons could only fight them with his own strength. But he lost. And he kept losing. He kept losing. He couldn't win. And the truth is, so often we feel that same struggle. That we just keep losing to the same issue over and over and over again. Why do I keep losing? Matthew records a teaching from Jesus. that shared what happens when a demon is cast out. And it's just a little bit of insight, but basically... He says this demon, when, when a demon is cast out of somebody, he goes around roaming in dry places and, 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 and he, he's looking for rest, but he can't find any. And so as he continues roaming, what he says to himself is, I'll go back. I'll go back where I came from. I'll go back to that person that I, I was sent out of and I'll just see how they're doing. And he goes back over there and he walks and he looks and he sees, and Jesus, the way he described it, said, he sees a house cleaned up, nice and neat, cookies in the oven, the candles are lit. It's a beautiful place. 
And he walks in, but he sees it's empty. It's all clean. It looks good, but it's empty. And he says, the demon sees the empty house. And what he does, he doesn't just move in. He looks back and he says, hey guys, you're not going to believe what I found. They cleaned up. Yeah, they kicked me out, but they cleaned it up and got it nice together. They put an addition on in the back. Like, we're good. Come on. Come on over. And Jesus said he brings, he brings more fellows with him that are worse than he was. And the end is worse than the beginning for this person. And I think the key to understanding that is that idea, that, that key word, empty. Empty. Void. You see, when the house is empty, it's vulnerable. When the house is empty, it, I, 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 it's vacant. It's ready for something else, somebody else to move in. And the enemy says, oh, we can... We can live there. I don't know the, the exact theology of how things worked out for that guy back then, but for you and I, I love the promise that we are filled with the Spirit. Amen. God's Spirit, and we don't have to worry about that. But we can't, we, as a believer, the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, and we don't need to worry about whether or not some demon is going to move in. But one thing I can tell you is while he may not be able to possess you, y'all know what I'm about to say, he can't oppress you. He, he can oppress you. He can't possess, but he can't oppress. He can be on the outside, and he can be shooting targets on the inside. And the, the Bible makes it very clear that that's what you should expect. That's what you should expect. And so how do we live? How do we respond? How do we prepare for this type of warfare? Where, where demonic forces are certainly going to rise up against us. How do we fight temptations like that? Struggles and discouragement. Well, you don't fight them by your own power. You see, you have the Spirit of God inside of you. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. You have the armor of God, which includes the word of God, outside of you. And he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the, the, the tricks of the devil. You have the people of God beside you. In, in, in Philippians it says, stand in one spirit, contending together with one mind for the faith. Now God gave us these things and he attached his name to each one of them. He said, listen, you got, you got the spirit of God you got the armor of God, you got the word of God, you got the people of God, and yet all those things attached to his name, and we go about living and fighting this war as if God has nothing to do with it. The, the spirit of God. The armor of God. The word of God. The people of God. We walk around... Like we're some type of spiritual Rambo. No army, no, no, no armor, no sense. <laughs> and we just go. Let's fight. And we wonder why we lose. We wonder why we're beat down and tired. You're feeling exhausted, broken. You're so worn down you spend more time crying than laughing. More time in a state of worry than a place of faith. More time being victimized by the enemy than being victorious over the enemy. Listen, that does not have to be your story, your narrative. It doesn't have to be. Like the, uh, this demon-possessed man who was set free. If Jesus could do it for him, he can do it for you. He chose you, so go. Go fight the enemy. Go live in joy. Go, go, go enjoy the peace of God. Because you have been chosen. And you are no longer captive to your problems. You are no longer carried by your own power. And finally, you are no longer called for your own purpose. In verse number 17, we see what I've already alluded to, and I'm sure you already know. Uh, after the verses that we read, we see this first little plot twist here says in verse 16, they saw it, they, they told him how it be, befell him, and how he that was possessed with the devil, and all the things that had just happened, and the swine that ran into the, the ocean, and all those things, they told him all about it. 
And the people that came out to see it, they said, thank you. Thank you for doing that. You healed this guy. You took care of him. Thank you so much. Oh, they didn't say that, did they? they uh, what they said was, man, that's awesome. If you were able to do that, why don't you come? My, my mama's sick back at the house. Would you come, come and heal her? You know, man, that's amazing that you were able to do that. We got all these issues. Would you come and, and, and heal some people in our land? They didn't say that, did they? Matter of fact, in verse 17, it says, And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. They couldn't control this guy. They, they saw the witness of what happened in this man right here. That is now sitting fully clothed, tamed, ready to go. He's having a good day now. And they look at him and say, Jesus, it's, it's time for you to go. You need, you need to get out of here. And I don't know if it was because they were worried about all the money they just lost with those pigs that killed themselves, or if it was they were worried, you know, what, what else, well, how did he do this, and we don't get it, and they're superstitious and all that stuff. Listen, when people don't understand, a lot of times they're just filled with fear, right? As we, as we look at this, we need to understand that, you know what, people may not get it, but that's okay. They may be filled with fear, but that's, that's okay. They ask Jesus to leave, he gets up, he heads back to the boat. As he's getting in the boat, we, we, we see something. We see that this man in verse number 18, he asks a question. And it's a question that makes perfect sense. He asks if he can go with him. Jesus, you just cast these demons out of me. You, I am so, listen, can I go with you? And imagine the emotions that he was feeling. I mean, this man, he was probably, I'm, I'm sure he was grateful to Jesus and he wanted to serve him. He was probably fearful of those demons that what if this happens again? I want to stay by your side. I, I need to stay with Jesus just in case, right? I, I'm sure he's filled with curiosity. This guy, I never know this guy before, but he just set me free. I, I, I want to know more about him. He's, he's broken, I'm sure, by the rejection that Jesus just experienced from his own people. And he wants to separate from those people. And I think he's probably realistic about his situation. I, I've been possessed. I've been living in tombs. I've, I, I've been out here. What? My family is, I don't even know where my family is. My friends. He's probably been there for years now. And he's realistic about his situation. Where, where am I going to go? Can I just come with you? Can I just stay with you? The request was noble. It made a lot of sense. It seemed to be a command that Jesus gave to others. Let a man take up his cross and follow me. It made sense, right? And of course Jesus would say yes, but then he said no. Why? Was, was this man not qualified? Well, none of Jesus' disciples were qualified. Was this man, did he have too shady of a background, of a past? Well, they all had kind of a shady background. What was it? I, I can see Jesus looking at this man with love and, and really wanting him to come, but then looking at the people that just rejected him. And I can see Jesus looking at them and then turning to the guy and saying, no, no, you can't, you can't come with me. Let's, let, let's look at it together. Verse number 19, he says, Jesus suffered him not, but saith to him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Man, I started thinking about that. And in all reality, this man became a missionary in a land that, that wasn't ready for Jesus. That was scared of Jesus. He was a missionary to his family. He didn't even know the gospel. But, but he could only share what he had experienced personally. These people were not ready for Jesus. They were afraid of Jesus. But this man served as a bridge. He would serve as a bridge and a living example of the impact that Jesus can have on your life. 
See, this wasn't the purpose that he wanted. He wanted to be with Jesus. But Jesus had a greater purpose for him because he wasn't living for himself anymore. What ambitions, purpose do you have? What purpose are you pursuing? Think about it for a second. What goals have you been chasing after? What plans are you making? Let me ask you a kind of a bold question. But have you ran that past God? I know like the reality is sometimes we're scared, right? Because what if God says no? What if God says do something else? What if God makes me change my plans? Well, what if? <laughs> what if that happens? But you know, let me, let me say this too. It might not be that God wants you to change and quit your job and become a missionary in a foreign land. It may not be that God wants you to give up all your dreams and your goals and your ambitions. It, it may be that he wants you to continue the job but change the purpose. Think about it for a second. Oh, continue go continue about your life but change the purpose see your purpose has changed so that when you cross paths with other people you begin to ask the question how can i bridge the gap from this person to jesus today see to some people jesus and god seems unrealistic and unlikely but your story could help them to some people jesus seems scary god seems judgmental but your story could help them to some people, Jesus, God, he seems, uh, he, he seems un unattainable and unavailable. But your story could help them. You say, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about this, and, and I don't know what to say, and I don't know what to do. Neither did the guy previously possessed by these demons. But you know what he said? He said, all right, I'll go. I don't know the gospel, Jesus. I don't have it memorized. I don't have the Old Testament memorized. I'm just going to be honest with you, Jesus. But, Jesus, if all you're wanting me to do is go and tell them the great things that you have done for me, I can do that. And it says that he went throughout the city publishing what Jesus had done. Not only with words, but with his life. He bridged that gap. A plot is more than just a series of events. A plot, it is built on a moment, a shift that raises a question that has to be answered. And throughout the whole story, everything points back to that twist, to that change, to that moment. You see, this man, he, he had a moment in time where his life was radically changed. It was a moment when the narrative changed. Throughout the, the story of his life, he would point back to the moment when Jesus stepped foot out of the boat in a city where he was not even welcomed. A, a, a moment in which even a legion of demons could not deny, could not resist. It was a moment in which he realized he was chosen. And he was no longer a captive to his problems. He was no longer carried were limited by his own power. He was no longer living for his own purpose. He was changed. Let me ask you, when, when was that moment for you? When was that moment? Think back on it. When did you trust in Jesus Christ, turning from your sin and leaning into a relationship with him? Do you know that you've done that? And if so, how is Jesus speaking to you today? What is he communicating to your heart today? What change is he trying to bring into your life? Imagine with me for just a minute. We're, we're done. Imagine what it would be like, what our community would be like if 200 plus people sitting here today, if, if we would just live like we were chosen. Think about it. What would happen in your family, in your household, if, if you just lived like you were chosen, what would happen in this church? What would this church look like if we just lived like we were chosen? If we said, he chose me, so I'll go. 
Maybe you're here today and you say, I can't really think of that moment. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I can't think of that moment. I, I always just assumed I was good because I went to church. I thought I was good because I've been baptized. I, I thought I was good because I, I do all these good things. Let me say that won't cut it. That's just cleaning up the house for the devil and his friends. Right? It's just cleaning up the house. But it's not filling the house. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, I, I, I know I'm not good. I don't even feel like I've got, my life has purpose right now. There's, there seems to be no plot. You wouldn't want to read this book, right? You know what? That, that, that dude we just read about, that was his story to start with. And that doesn't have to be you anymore. You don't have to be captive to your problems anymore. Your addictions, your past, your hurts. You don't have to be carried by your power anymore. It doesn't take you far enough anyways. It just wears you out. You don't, you don't have to be called for your own purpose anymore because there's something greater out there. He chose you, so go.